Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'd like to welcome all of you all to the Applied Bhagavatam classes. So, um, for all those who are online and who are here present, I'm hoping that these Bhagavatam classes are um, really worth your time and uh, you are really learning and enthusiastically absorbed in the Bhagavatam. And hopefully, all of you all, when you go back homes through the week, you are reading some Bhagavatam to kind of recollect and uh, reassimilate what we discuss. And hopefully, you are doing some Mananam also <laughs> based on what we discussed last time. Okay. Today, we are going to be doing a very, very important and a very, very powerful chapter of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, the first canto which is called as Drona's son punished and we're going to be seeing we're going to be seeing one single story in this uh, you know the whole episode basically so the next two or three sessions are pretty exciting because they all connected to the Mahabharata and they all connected with great personalities so today's session is going to be on uh, the conversation between the whole dynamics of Ashwatthama, Arjun, Draupadi and Bhima and the next week's session is going to be on Pundi Maharani's prayers which is one of the highlights of the Srimad Bhagavatam and the week after that is going to be on Bhishma Dev, the discussion of Bhishma Dev with Krishna and Yudhishthira Maharaj. So the next three classes are, you can expect them to be like explosions one after another. Uh, they are all about some great Mahajans basically. So. Today's session, um, it begins with a very interesting story. So what I'm going to be doing is that I'm going to be narrating the story as we go ahead. And uh, through the story, as I'm, as I'm narrating the story and uh, uh, reciting the verses and all, we'll be taking breaks and absorbing, going deep into some powerful stuff that can potentially transform our hearts. So today's session is called the anatomy of the human heart, right? So the, the whole theme today is I'm going to be inspecting four hearts today. I'm going to be inspecting the heart of Arjun. I'm going to be inspecting the heart of Ashwatthama. I'm going to be inspecting the heart of Draupadi and the heart of Bhima. And finally, after we inspect these four personalities hearts, then we're going to be inspecting the heart of Krishna. So that's the that's the whole theme today and that's the mood in which we're going to discuss okay so drona's son is ashwatthama and because he is the son of drona he is also called as droni that's one of the names of ashwatthama and he is the great grandson of bharadvaj muni so drona in his um, in his days of yore he pleased the Lord Shiva and uh, got a benediction for having a son who would become undefeatable. As a result was born Ashwatthama who was a Chiranjeevi with a jewel on his head. And um, when he was born, he cried like a horse. And because he had a cry of a horse, he was called as Ashwatthama. The word Ashwa means horse. And you know the word uh, Ashwatthama means the one who cries like a horse, basically. So now, obviously, the idea of uh, Ashwatthama's life, uh, or rather, you know, the discussion of Ashwatthama's life comes in here in this particular section of the Bhagavatam because this story that we're going to be he uh, hearing now is literally giving birth to the Bhagavatam. So the entire Srimad Bhagavatam is born, kind of, as a result of this story. Because eventually after this story is going to be born Parikshit Maharaj, who is the one for whom the Bhagavatam has spoken. So this is like a prelude uh, to, the, uh, to the person who is going to hear the Bhagavatam. So the first canto is more or less like setting the stage for the entire Bhagavatam. You know? So more or less all the characters are being introduced um, and the whole theme of the Bhagavatam is being introduced in the first canto. So Barabar, right? Okay. So... Um, Ashwatthama was a very interesting personality. 
I'm going to give you some little background before we enter into this particular story, just to understand how this fellow thinks. You know, since we are not just uh, talking about the personality, but we are inspecting their hearts, right? So I'm going to give you a little background to understand the heart of Ashwatthama and why he does what he does. And when I tell you this background, then you'll understand the story better. From the day Ashwatthama was born, he was born the son of Drona. Naturally, if you are born the son of somebody as powerful as Drona, it is not easy to meet, meet expectations, right? Anybody whose father or mother is very powerful has a lot of pressure of performance, right? I mean, history has it that any powerful personality whose son is expected to be actually as powerful has a lot of pressure and sometimes they do things that are not exactly respectable to get that respect. So usually people earn respect after a lifetime of effort. And there are some people who may not be ready to put that kind of effort to get, earn the respect they wanted like that. It's called shortcut to success, you know. So Ashwatthama was one of those people who wanted to earn respect without actually working for it. So from the day he was born, he um, had some innate powers in him. The jewel that he was on, that was on his head, gave him some solid powers. He would not get sick. He would not feel hungry. He would not feel thirsty. He could never be defeated by anyone. He, would, he could never be killed. So imagine if you have a jewel like that, do you have to fear anything? No. Obviously not. But the interesting thing is Ashwatthama, whenever he was challenged, he would go and hide behind his father, Dronacharya. Because somehow he didn't make himself competent for dealing with those challenges, but he always took shelter of Drona. And obviously Drona defeated, you know, whoever came to attack him. So Ashwatthama, he felt incompetent and instead of working hard to become competent, he decided, I am the son of Drona. If I ask my father, he'll give me anything. And he adopted that idea of getting whatever he wanted by asking his father. So one day, Dronacharya was very pleased with Arjun and gave him the Brahmastra. When Dronacharya was very pleased to Arjun given the Brahmastra, Ashwatthama saw that and he said, I also want the Brahmastra. So Dronacharya said, you are not qualified for the Brahmastra. Brahmastra is a nuclear weapon. It can't be just handed over to some kid who is crying, isn't it? But Ashwatthama was so, so adamant and so much upset that uh, Dronacharya had no option but to give him that Brahmastra. He gave him the Brahmastra and he was literally disgusted with Ashwatthama after the way he took it from him, from his father, you know. So it didn't make Dronacharya proud. It, it made him sad. And Ashwatthama, he also knew that he didn't deserve it. He just snatched it. So this is Ashwatthama's background, basically. What he has, he doesn't use it properly. What he doesn't have is what he feels he deserves. Arjuna, on the other hand, Whatever he had, he used it properly. And because he used everything he had properly, he got more. This is known as the law of attraction. The law of attraction is when you use what you have well, you get more. And if you don't use what you have well, you lose what you have also, literally. So Ashwatthama, he, um, instead of becoming competent, he preferred to eliminate competition by any means basically in life what you have does not matter what matters is what you do with what you have a lot of times um, i have a lot of things but what i have doesn't matter what i do with what i have really matters life usually can be lived by making a lack list or a list of abundance. There are many things that we lack in life, but there are also many things that we have in life. You can decide to live life by making a lack list. List of so many things, I lack this, I lack this, I lack this, I lack this. I can go on making a list of things that I lack. But instead of making a list of what you lack, 
make a list of what you have and make better use of what you have. So instead of Ashwatthama running after Brahmastra, instead of Ashwatthama running after you know uh, things that he doesn't have, he already has so much. Why not make better use of that? So usually most people in this world who have achieved anything of substance, they have focused on what they have and not on what they lack. Take names of people, like say for example, Beethoven. He was deaf, but he, he composed the best music in the world, though he couldn't hear his own composition, basically. Um, Einstein, he was a hunchback man, but he redefined science. Um, John Milton, he was blind, but he wrote some of the most amazing poetry on uh, nature, which he never saw. You know? So there are people who don't have, but they didn't focus on what they don't have. Rather, they focused on what they have. And they made great achievements in life. And here is Ashwatthama. He has a lot. Instead of focusing on what he has, he's totally focusing on what he doesn't have. And he's miserable. Ashwatthama, he did many shortcuts throughout his life. One time he went to Lord Krishna in Dwarka and he told him, um, I have an exchange offer for you. I'll give you my Brahmastra, give me your Sudarshan Chakra. Yeah. Imagine that. So Krishna asked him, why the hell, why do you want my Sudarshan Chakra? He said, I want to use it to kill you. Imagine going to Krishna and talking like that. Yeah. So Ashatama has done a lot of shortcuts in his life. But the last shortcut that he did really backfired. And what was the shortcut? That's what this story of the Bhagavatam is. So he, um, on the last day of the Mahabharat war, he goes into the camp of the Pandavas. Duryodhan has fallen. The entire Kaurava army is finished. There are only literally three people alive in the entire Kaurava army. Left alive. Kripacharya, Ashwatthama and uh, I think Satik, you know, not Satik. One more. I don't remember who is the third one. Anyway, so uh, nobody else is alive. Everyone else is Kritavarma. Kritavarma. Three, three people are alive. Everybody else is dead. And Duryodhana has fallen. Ashwatthama, in his last attempt, he tells Duryodhan, before you die, I'll fulfill your desire to kill the Pandavas. That's his like last desire. And Ashwatthama realized, I can't fight with the Pandavas straight. I will, they, will, they will kill me. So he said, let me go and play it unfair. He decided to go into the camp of the Pandavas when they were sleeping at night and cut their heads. And he did that. Unfortunately, before that happened, Krishna had taken the Pandavas away for some other uh, uh, thing. And instead of killing the Pandavas, he killed the five sons of the Pandavas who were sleeping. And he brought the heads of the five sons of the Pandavas to Duryodhan. And he said, I've done what you always desired. Duryodhan, he just touched the heads of the five sons of the Pandavas and he realized this cannot be the Pandavas. He said, you foolish fellow, you have disgusted me. First of all, Duryodhan did not want him to go and kill the Pandavas like that. Duryodhan, no matter how bad he was, he was still a respectable warrior. He still, you know, believed in, you know, uh, in fighting rightly. And he died so miserably, thinking that what an obnoxious thing this fellow has done. And he died with that thought. So instead of fulfilling the desire of Duryodhan, he actually made him even more miserable, even more sadder. Ashwatthama, uh, he did not understand the hearts, the hearts of his masters. Neither did he understand Drona's heart, nor did he understand Duryodhan's heart. So a person who does not understand the heart of his master is literally the saddest person on, in the world. The spiritual master, the guru, your teachers, they actually spend a lot of try time trying to teach you, trying to share with you what their mood is. Very, very few people actually understand the mood of their guru, the mood of their teachers, the mood of their fathers in this case, and the mood of you know uh, his master Duryodhan here. <coughs> One time, um, there was this great devotee named Gaur Kishodas Babaji Maharaj. Who was, um, in, who was in our parampara and uh, he expressed a desire that when I die, my body should be dragged through
through the streets of Navdeep. This was his last desire when he died, basically. And then Gorkshad Das Babaji Maharaj he left his body. And all the disciples of Gorkshad Das actually he had no disciples, but all the people that were his admirers and well wishers and followers and all that, they were actually planning to tie up Gorkshad Das Babaji Maharaj's body and drag it through Navdeep. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarastakur, he arrived at that time and he said, what are you doing? They told him, his last desire is that his body should be dragged through the streets of Navadip. He said, have you gone mad? Understand the spirit of what he's trying to say. When he says my body should be dragged through the streets of Navadip, it doesn't mean actually it should be dragged. He is he's saying that the soil of Navadip, the land of Navadip is what he really is dying for. And he wants that he be taken in a procession across the streets of Navadip. It's not that you actually drag him through the streets of Navadip, you know. This is the difference between understanding words and understanding the intentions behind the words. A lot of us, we are experts in English language or whatever language it may be, you know. But the language is only a means to communicate the heart, isn't it? The language is only a means to communicate what is there in your heart. So if you are not able to understand what the person is trying to say, what is there in that person's heart, then it doesn't matter what language you speak, you still won't understand it. And then there are people who don't even have to hear words and they understand everything, right? So this is the difference between uh, somebody who just theoretically hears and does. So Duryodhana wanted the five Pandavas dead, Ashwatthama went and did it. But at what cost? In what way? Without understanding the heart of Duryodhana at all. And that's why Duryodhana died disappointed. And even his own father, Dronacharya, through the life of Dronacharya, he experienced nothing but disappointment from Ashwatthama. So now, uh, when Draupadi hears the death of her five children, she was so disturbed. And she began to cry in great distress. Her eyes were filled with tears. And trying to pacify her, Arjun, he promised her, he tells her, I will get you the head of Ashwatthama. And after beheading him, you know, with my arrows, uh, then I will wipe your tears. And he said, then we will burn the bodies of our sons. And then you stand on the head of Ashwatthama and take a bath. So like that, you know, Arjun is trying to pacify her. Arjun then wore his armor and went to fight. So uh, he and Krishna went on a chariot to pursue Ashwatthama. So Ashwatthama saw Arjun coming along with Krishna on a chariot very fast towards him. And Ashwatthama started running away with great speed on his own chariot. At some point, the speed of his chariot decreased because Ashwatthama's horses are not celestial like Arjun's horses, you know. And when he saw that his horses were tired, he realized that I have to save myself because Arjun is going to catch me soon. And then in his last uh, panic situation, he did something drastic. <laughs> he realized, if I have to save my life, the only way I can save my life is if I release the Brahmastra. So, to save his own life, he released the Brahmastra. The Brahmastra should never be released to save your own life. That's the last thing you do with the Brahmastra. I mean, imagine firing a nuclear weapon to save your life. It doesn't even make any sense, you know. That's like the, the lowest thought process you can have. So he had so much fear in his heart. And in that panic and fear, he took a bad decision. And he released the Brahmastra. <clears throat> so there are two reasons why Ashwatthama had fear in his heart. The first reason was that he, he loved his body and he felt that this body is going to die or it's going to get hurt, you know. So I don't want to get hurt. So I'll do anything to save my own body. And the second reason he had fear was because he had done something wrong. When you do something wrong, there's a lot of fear in the heart. It's a very natural type of fear, basically. So Ashwatthama realized that I, I made a big mistake. I've done something wrong and I'm getting scared. So Ashwatthama was a Brahmana. But though he was a Brahmana, he didn't have any Brahminical qualities. There are two people who are fearless, Kshatriyas and Brahmanas. 
Kshatriyas are fearless because they have courage in the heart. Brahmanas are fearless because they have knowledge in the heart. Everybody else will be very, very fearful. Why? Because if courage and knowledge is absent, you can't deal with fear. The only things that can help you deal with fear are either courage or knowledge. If you see people in the borders, the people in the army, what kind of uh, fearlessness they exhibit? That's, that's because they have so much courage in the heart. Brahmanas don't have courage, but they have something which replaces courage, that is knowledge. And if someone has Atma Gyan, understands I am not the body only, I am the spirit soul, that Atma Gyan makes them fearless. Because that knowledge they understand that nothing can harm my body, why should I fear? Right? So if you don't have courage and if you don't have Atma Gyan, you are only a Brahmana in name. Therefore, if you see through the, through the uh, chapter, Ashwatthama is called as Brahmana Bandhu. Brahmana Bandhu means friend of a Brahmana, relative of a Brahmana. But he is not a Brahmana. So a lot of people in this world, they are born from Brahmanical families. But they are not necessarily Brahmanas. They are all Brahmana Bandhus. Till they prove it. And when you, how do you prove that you are a Brahmana? The element of knowledge. And that element of knowledge has to be present during the most difficult times of your life. It is not that you exhibit knowledge during normal times. During a crisis, what knowledge you exhibit? That's the knowledge that you have. During crisis, if you exhibit no knowledge or if you exhibit, you know, no action based on knowledge, then you don't have the knowledge. Because the knowledge when it is, you know, like a, a karna, right? He was cursed. When you need the knowledge, the most you will forget it. So a lot of us are like that, you know. <laughs> we, we have a lot of knowledge, but when we need it the most, we completely forget it. That knowledge is like hardly useful, isn't it? So Ashwatthama, he panicked and took a very bad decision. And interestingly, this particular section of the Mahabharat, you know, where this particular section is described in the Mahabharat, this Parva is called as Sauptika Parva. Most Parvas in the Mahabharat are named after characters. There is Drona Parva, Karna Parva, Bhishma Parva, like that. You know, there are, most of the Parvas are named after characters, you know, or because of some uh, event, basically. This is the only Parva that has a very different name. You know what is the meaning of the word Sauptika? Sauptika means sleep. Hmm? Sleep. <laughs> so how come a Parva is named Sleep Parva? Does it make any sense? The reason this Parva is named Sauptika Parva as a Sleep Parva is because Ashwatthama killed the sons of, of Pandavas when they were asleep. Essentially Vyasdev is trying to say his conscience was asleep. Because his conscience was asleep, therefore he could do something like this, as heinous as this. So his heart was not in a state of awakeness. When your heart is awakened, you act uh, with conscience. But when your heart is asleep, you act stupidly like this. So, um, Sauptika. S-A-U-P. Sauptika. So, this particular section of the of uh, the Bhagavatam, so, you know, uh, what I said essentially was that uh, Bra uh, um, Ashwatthama released the Brahmastra out of panic. And after he released the Brahmastra, he had no idea what to do because he didn't have the knowledge of retracting it. He only had the knowledge of releasing it, but he didn't have the knowledge of retracting it. Because there is a reason why he didn't have the knowledge of retracting it. Because to retract the Brahmastra, you need to have good character. Only a person who has spotless character can retract the Brahmastra. Anybody can release the Brahmastra. <laughs> but to retract the Brahmastra, you need a spotless character. And therefore, Dronacharya was hesitating to give it to this fellow. Because this fellow can release it. But he cannot retract it. One way. Dronacharya knew this fellow cannot retract the Brahmastra because he is not qualified to retract it only. So he kept telling his son, I can't give it to you, I can't give it to you, you are not qualified. But because he insisted, he gave it to him anyways. And now he has released the Brahmastra and he has no idea what to do. The entire universe was literally on the verge of devastation. At that time, Arjun steps in. 
So Arjun, he sees this massive, massive calamity, not just approaching him, but it's approaching the entire universe. Brahmastra is not supposed to just destroy one person. When it is released, it destroys the entire universe. Just like a nuclear bomb, it destroys an entire country, literally. It can wipe out a country. Similarly, Brahmastra doesn't just destroy one person. It can wipe out an entire civilization. So Arjun saw the Brahmastra coming. He was really scared. And obviously, he knew what it is. He already has the Brahmastra with him. And he has the science. He knows the science of Brahmastra. But it is very interesting how Arjun deals with the calamity. We just saw how Ashwatthama dealt with the calamity. And now we are going to see how Arjun is dealing with the calamity. And literally, it is few verses away from each other. And the way they each one deals with the calamity is so amazing. This shows the heart of a devotee. So let us understand Arjun's heart through this verse. The first verse that Arjun speaks. Arjuna Vacha Krishna Krishna Mahabaho Krishna Krishna Bhaktana Vabayankara Tvam Eko Dhyamananam Eko Apavargo Si Samsrita Samsrita Arjuna says Oh my Lord Shri Krishna, you are the almighty personality of Godhead. There is no limit to your energies. Therefore, only you are competent to instill fearlessness in the hearts of your devotees. Bhaktanam Abhayankara, he says. And everyone in the flame of the material uh, miseries can find path of liberation only in you. So here, Krishna, uh, Arjun is taking shelter of Krishna. When in a calamity, a devotee naturally takes shelter of Krishna. Arjun is competent. It's not that Arjun doesn't have competence. Arjun is competent. But even though he is competent, he naturally takes shelter of Krishna because that's literally his second nature. Um, Tulsi Das Ji, Tulsidas Goswami Maharaj, he says, if you want to ask God, ask for three things. One, ask for love that a parent has for a child. Ask for faith that friends have in each other. And ask for a fear that a subject has in his king. And he says, yeah, when you pray to the Lord, you should pray that, my dear Lord, let me have these three relationships with you. Just like a parent has love for the child, let me have love for you. Just like a friend has faith in another friend, let me have faith in you. And just like a subject has fear uh, from his king, let me fear you. Now, why should we fear the Lord? So it is explained that we should have a healthy amount of fear of God in our lives so that we don't misbehave after getting his love and friendship. One should never become fearless of God. One should always have a little bit of fear uh, of God. Like for example, in the Ramayana, we find Lakshman is the most fearless person. He doesn't get scared at all. Who overcomes in front of him? Lakshman doesn't fear at all. Uh, in fact, you know, when uh, the whole world was afraid of Parashuram, Lakshman, he said, I'll fight. The whole world is afraid of Kumbhakarna, Lakshman said, I'll fight. Whole world is afraid of Indrajit, Lakshman came out, he said, I'll fight. So Lakshman, he doesn't have any fear in his heart. So Ram asks him, my dear Lakshman, you are Kal. You know, Lakshman is Ananta Shesh, he's Ananta Kal, basically. So Ram asks him, you are Kal, you are time personified. And you fear no one. But how come you fear me? Lakshman always feared Ram. You know, whatever Ram says, you'd be like little, you know, uh, a little scared in front of Ram. So Lakshman tells Lord Ram, my dear Lord, I want to show the world, if Kala is scared of you, then definitely everybody else should be scared of you also. <laughs> if Kala himself, if time himself is scared of Krishna, then all of us should have a little bit of 
fear of God. This is called as healthy fear. Um, in the in the in the scriptures, we always find there are some people who are fearless of God, and there are some people who very who are scared of God. And the interesting thing is, those who seem to be brave, like the demons, you will find so many demons challenging God left, right, center. They seem to be have no having no fear of God. But at the same time, you'll find devotees, like say, for example, in the Ramayana, we find Bali. Bali was not scared at all of anybody, but Sugri was scared. So a little bit of fear is good in life. To have bhakti, to attain bhakti, one must have a little bit of fear. Fearlessness is not necessarily bhakti. If you have a little bit of fear of God, which is, this is known as healthy fear. And that healthy fear will help you run towards God. And uh, fearlessness or unhealthy fearlessness, it will help you run away from God basically. So every single devotee of the Lord should have a little bit of fear. So you are, if you see here Arjun, he exhibits a little bit of fear. The moment he sees something calamitous coming, you know. So he says, Krishna Krishna Mahabhao, running towards uh, Krishna. Ashwatthama, his fear took him away from God. And Arjun's fear takes him towards God. This is the difference between a devotee's fear and a non-devotee's fear, uh, fear. A non-devotee's fear takes him away from God more. But a devotee's fear takes him towards God more. So Arjun, he tells Krishna, Twam Adya Purusha Sakshad Ishwara Prakrte Para Mayam Vyudasya Chikshaktya Kaivalye Stita Atmani so here he calls Krishna as Purusha. What is the meaning of the word Purusha? The word Purusha, uh, where, did this, where did this name come from? The, there are three tattvas in the Vedanta. The first tattva is known as Achit. Achit means that which doesn't give space to knowledge. Achit means that, does, that which doesn't have a heart. And then there is something known as Chit. Chit means that which gives space to knowledge. And then the third one is called Ishwara. Ishwara is the one who controls both Chit and Achit. It's called Ishwara, basically. So there are these three tattvas. Chit means uh, conscious. Achit means unconscious. And Ishwara means control the one who controls both. The word Chit, the Chit is divided into three parts. Chit means conscious, right? A chit means unconscious, like stones are unconscious. Chit means a human being is chit, is conscious. There are three types of chits in this world. There is something called as Badhatma, they are bound by karma. Then there is something called Muktatma, they attain liberation. Like Muktatmas are like, you know, those who get green card, basically, you know. They're liberated. A lot of people in America, the moment they get green card, they feel they are liberated, you know, <coughs> from all the bonds of this world, you know. So like that, those who are muktatmas, they get liberation from this world and they get entry into the, they, it's like they're getting visa into the spiritual world. That's called uh, muktatma. And the third one is called nityatma. Nityatmas, they, they eternally stay in Vaikuntha only, in the spiritual world only. They don't come only to the material world, right? So Ishwara is called Purusha because he's different from all the three. He's, di he's different from Achit and therefore he is called as Utpurusha. He is different from the Badhatmas, therefore he is called as Uttara Purusha. And he is different from the Muktatmas also, therefore he is called as Uttama Purusha. So Krishna is called Purusha in this world because he controls everything, the conscious and the unconscious. So Arjun is calling here Krishna as Purusha because he is saying, I can't understand the power that is attacking us. But you are Purusha, you know everything. So with that mood, he is offering this prayer to Krishna. All of us, we pray nicely during good times in life. But when we go through a calamity and difficulty in life, we immediately forget God. And we try to solve our problems with our own intelligence, 
right? But great devotees like Arjun, as soon as there is a calamity, before they use their own competence, their own abilities, they first take shelter of the Lord. Arjun can easily stop the Brahmastra. But that's not the point here. Arjun feels, if a calamity has come in my life, it is an opportunity for me to take shelter of the Lord. One time, there was a man who lived in a village. And in this village, there was a ritual that they followed very strictly. The ritual they followed was that whenever a boy is going to become an adult, he's going to become a man, this every boy would have to do one very big test. Only if they pass in this test, they'll be declared a man and they'll be given responsibilities of a man. And what was the test they had to do? They would have to go to the middle of a forest in the middle of the night alone. And they would have to sit on a log of wood through the whole night with a blindfold on their eyes and not move one inch from the log of wood, no matter what happens. And if they stay alive next day morning and if they are, the blindfold is still on and everything is fine, then they declared you are a man. And this one boy was sitting there on this log of wood. His father left him there, you know, blindfolded him. And he was trembling, all kinds of sounds and animals and you know, uh, the, uh, the sounds of the forest are dangerous in the middle of the night. And he was imagining all kinds of things, you know, this animal is looking at me. That uh, He was really scared, but somehow he decided no matter what, I'm just going to sit here. Whole night, with so much fear he sat there. Next day morning, he opened his eyes. And he saw his father was sitting there only, all through the night, next to him. All of us are very much like this boy in the dark night of this of, of life, you know. And we are we are so scared because there are so many unknown forces, there are so many calamities. There, I mean, you don't know what's going to happen to the stock market tomorrow. You don't know what's you know what kind of virus is going to come. You don't know anything. And to top it all, there is a new budget that comes up. You know, we don't even understand what the tax is. So it's very complicated world we are living in. If you just remember that right next to us, our father is sitting, right next to us, Krishna is sitting. Life is so much more easier to live. You know, the moment we know there is somebody looking out, out for us, somebody is looking at us, you know, constantly. Arjun, he had that consciousness and he was constantly in touch, in sync with Krishna in his life. So Arjun asks Krishna, O oh Lord, how is it that this dangerous effulgence is spreading around? I, I don't understand. So Krishna then tells him that this is the act of the son of Drona. And he says he has thrown uh, the nuclear weapon Brahmastra and he does not know how to retract it. So he tells him, he tells Arjun, only another Brahmastra can counteract this weapon. So he says, you are expert in the science of military weapons. He says, please subdue this Brahmastra using your own Brahmastra. So it is explained then that Arjun releases his Brahmastra. Now, there are two Brahmastras counteracting each other. And the, 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 the effulgence, the power and the sounds that are emitting because of two Brahmastra colliding against each other is like intolerable. It almost feels that the entire universe is going to get destroyed. And uh, Arjun was really worried that the whole civilization is going to get destroyed. And he expresses his concern to Lord Krishna. And Krishna tells him, you use your intelligence now and retract both the weapons. So this is um, the, the third uh, prayer. Prajopadravam alaksya Loka vyatikaram chatam Matam cha vasudevasya Sanjaha arjuno dvayam So seeing that the entire population, the general population is going to get destroyed, Arjun immediately retracts both the weapons, 
by the instructions of Lord Krishna. This is very interesting. Ashwatthama, when he gets scared, he destroys the whole world. Arjuna is scared, he is still concerned about the whole world. This is the difference between the heart of Ashwatthama and the heart of Arjun. When you and me get scared, are we concerned about our neighbors? Are we concerned about, you know, human society? Are we concerned about, uh, you know, everybody? We are hardly bothered about anybody else. Because when someone is scared, they, are, they, they can only deal with their own pain and their own troubles. They don't care for others. They become so insensitive towards others. But Arjun is scared. And in spite of being scared, he was concerned about other people. And it is said, uh, Arjun, um, he retracted the weapons of both the Brahmastras at the same time. I spoke about the importance of character to be able to retract the Brahmastras. So Arjun now in his eyes, he is blazing in anger. The calamity is, uh, is uh, sorted. Arjun is really, really angry and he goes and arrests Ashwatthama, ties him up with ropes like an animal. And after binding up Ashwatthama, Arjun wants to take him to the camp. At that time, Krishna comes up to Arjun and starts talking to him in a very angry mood. Now, Ashwatthama releasing the Brahmastra is one story that we just saw. I'm going to tell you all another story now. During the war, when Dronacharya was killed, unfairly, you know, Ashwatthama became really upset and really disturbed. And, it is, and in his great anger, at that time, he released another weapon called the Narayanastra. And again, the Narayanastra was so powerful that it could destroy the entire Pandava army at one go. And the power of the Narayanastra, the speciality of the Narayanastra was that when you try to attack the Narayanastra, it becomes more powerful. If one person goes and attacks the Narayanastra, Narayanastra becomes two. If three people go and attack the Narayanastra, Narayanastra becomes six. So the more number of people attack it, the more it expands. So literally the entire Pandava army was trying to attack the Narayanastra, the Narayanastra expanding so hugely. Nobody was able to understand how to counteract it. Even Arjuna was totally bewildered. He had never seen a weapon like this. And he had no idea how to counter it. At that time, Krishna got up and he told Arjun and all the Pandavas, drop your weapons and fall flat on the floor. The only way to counter the Narayanastra is surrender to it. Arjun dropped his weapons. All the Pandavas dropped their weapons. The entire army dropped their weapons. Everyone doing Dandavat in the middle of a battlefield. Krishna converted the battlefield into a temple. Imagine, you know, thousands of people doing Dandavat in the middle of a war, you know. Literally everyone dropped their weapons and surrendered to the Narayanastra. Only Bhima went to fight against it. But of course, Krishna wrestled against Bhima, threw him on the floor and made him lie down. Now, there are two different astras Ashwatthama released. One astra, Krishna tells him, attack. Another astra, Krishna is telling, bend. In life, that's what life is, isn't it? You should know when to attack and you should know when to bend. The problem with us is that when we need to bend, we attack. And when we need to attack, we bend. Krishna is simply trying to help us understand attack and bend are both needed in life. You should just know when to do what. Look at this. Soft people in our life, we attack them so badly. And tough people in our life, we get so scared of them and we become like, you know, literally like, you know, mouse in front of them, isn't it? It's a very interesting phenomenon of life, isn't it? Uh, Ashwatha, same Ashwatthama, releasing two different weapons and Krishna giving two different ways to counteract it. This is a war of life. We are all fighting, you know, we are all having our own battles in life, you know. And we are going to face uh, Ashwatthama's attacks in different ways, you know. And whenever we, we are in this situation of being attacked, by whoever it is, we should simply know when to bend and when to when to stand up. There are some situations in life that need you to bend, especially when, when, when people are very important to you in your life. 
especially when when you have people that you love especially when you have fights with people that you really care for and that are very important to you there we we release brahmastra only literally i mean people just talk about divorce as if it is like nothing you know every second day brahmastra being released you know every second day you talk about i finish i want to end this relationship only you know are baba brahmastra can't be released on a daily basis you know it is once and that's all it's a nuclear weapon well once it is released it can't be retracted by most people also isn't it and therefore um these two aspects and is the same arjun the same arjun is one time bending and one time fighting uh, under the guidance of krishna obviously so the heart of a devotee is ready for both it's not that arjun cannot fight and it's not that arjun cannot bend arjun is ready to bend also is ready to fight also but according to the need of the hour so krishna he tells arjun arjun don't show any mercy to this fellow and he says he calls him as brahmana bandhu is a relative of brahmana is kill innocent boys in their sleep and look at krishna's words mattam pramattam unmattam suptam balam striyam jadam प्रपन्नम विरथम वित्तम न रिपुम हंति धर्म वित हि सेज अ पर्सन हु नोज द प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ रिलीजन डज नॉट किल एन एनिमी हु इज केयरलेस इंटॉक्सिकेटेड इनसेन अस्लीप अफ्रेड और डिवॉइड ऑफ ए चैरियट नॉट डज ही किल अ बॉय अ वुमेन a foolish creature or a surrendered soul he said these are people that you should not fight with look at this you have very clear instruction of whom you cannot fight with it says you careless people intoxicated people insane people people who are asleep who are afraid or devoid of chariot so and he said last he thinks surrendered soul if somebody actually takes shelter of you you cannot you cannot kill that person and he says this person he has killed others for his own uh, you know to save his own life and therefore he says and then krishna tells him more than that you have promised draupadi that you will kill this fellow you will bring the head of the killer of her son so he says that somebody who has uh, killed someone in, uh, for, uh, of your family and that too he has murdered small children he said there is no problem in killing such a person krishna is telling arjun imagine god is instructing arjun no problem in killing him kill him and at this point arjun does something very interesting and this is what defines arjun's heart suta vacha suta vacha evam parikshita dharmam धंतुसुत यद्यपि सो हियर द वर्ड दट इज वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग इज दैट एवं परीक्षित धर्म now krishna was actually testing arjun in this particular context he was trying to test arjun let's see what arjun does when i tell him go kill this fellow it's okay to kill him i give him reasons also i give him shastra reference also that you can kill him you know let's see how he deals with it krishna is testing arjun so arjun he thought about it partha krishnena chodita so when uh, krishna is pushing him go and kill him arjun thinks about it a little bit and then he somehow feels you know he doesn't feel good with this idea of killing ashwatthama he he somehow feels that you know i don't want to do this you know and he doesn't kill him he drags him and brings him to the camp basically <coughs> arjun is trying to teach us a very important principle of life don't follow anyone blindly 
even if it is Krishna. Krishna is telling him, kill him. Arjun is still thinking. Something feels wrong, you know. If something doesn't feel right, Arjun is feeling like that. And uh, therefore, he is thinking and not acting. When uh, Lord Ram was uh, traveling with Vishwamitra Muni, and this massive demoness named Tataka comes to attack them. Vishwamitra tells him, kill her. Ram is like hesitating so much because this is the first, woman, first uh, demon that he's going to kill and it's a woman. Krishna also killed first demon, woman only. But he didn't think so much. He straight away killed him. <laughs> Krishna doesn't have to think. He is like the supreme person that you got it. But Ram, he's setting, he is a Maryada Purushottam, he's setting standard for humanity. Think so much. He's analyzing whether it is right or wrong, you know, and he's analyzing his Guru's words. Vishwamitra Muni him, kill him. He's thinking, is this what the scriptures will say? Is this what will please the Lord? He's thinking. And then finally, after a lot of analysis, Vishwamitra Muni tells him, this lady is not a woman only. And Vishwamitra Muni tells him the, the qualities of, of a woman. And then finally, Ashwin, uh, Ram realizes this is not, this, I can kill her. Then he kills. And that too, he doesn't kill straight away. He cuts the hands first, giving her one more chance, you know, for rectification. So then finally, he kills. So, great personalities take their time to understand and decide. I learned a very important principle of management. It's called delayed management. If you don't know what to do, wait. Sometimes the answer comes later, you know. So Arjun, he was not sure what to do because something in his heart told him this seems wrong. This seems wrong. Krishna is telling, still this seems wrong. Arjun is, you know, thinking. And then together they reach uh, the, the camp of the Pandavas. And here, we are going to see Draupadi's heart. So, so far we saw the heart of Ashwatthama and then we saw the heart of Arjun. Now we are going to see the heart of Draupadi, which is even more interesting. Life is your personal Leela. Just like there is Krishna Leela, your life is your own Leela. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what all others are trying to do. What matters is what you are doing. If you're playing a game, you know, somebody's playing cricket or football, any game you play, you know, you can't say, Are, I'm not getting the ball only, you know. Baba, it's, that's how the game is. And I remember when I was uh, small, I, we were, uh, I was in a school where there were almost 60, 70 boys in one classroom. And when we used to play football, one ball and 70 boys. I, you you had to figure out. You, know, you can't cry and sitting in one corner. I'm not getting ball only. Hey, Baba, go and figure it out. Nobody is going to help you get that ball. You go and figure it out. You have to fight for it, basically. You know? That's how life is. You See, life is not always going to be good to you. Life is not always going to be considerate to you. Life is not always going to be fair to you. Life is not always going to be beautiful to you. Life is going to be what it is. But you have to play the game nicely. You can't complain about it. The field of life belongs to a lot of people, not just you. You are one of the players in that field of life. But you can't say life has to be fair only to me. The, the game has to be favor, favorable only to me. That's not how life works. Let us see how Draupadi is playing the game of life. You know. So when Ashutama is brought um, to Draupadi, now the moment Draupadi sees Ashwatthama tied up like an animal, she reacts very differently. I am very unexpected of, of somebody like Draupadi. Tathartam Pashuvat Pashabadham Avan Mukham Karma Jujupsitena Nirikshya Krishna 
प्रकृतम गुरु सुतम वाम स्वभाव कृपया न नाम च शी रन्स टुवर्ड्स अशोथामा एंड शी स्टार्ट्स अनटाइंग हिम शी सेस हाउ कैन यू बाइंड अप द सन ऑफ आर गुरु लाइक दिस शी रन्स टुवर्ड्स हिम एंड बिकॉज ऑफ हर you know soft nature she showed respect to him as a brahmana now who is this this fellow just killed her five sons he just killed her five sons and yet she is untying him she is saying you can't disrespect this fellow you can't disrespect this person he is still the son of our guru uwa उवाच चासंती अस्य बंदना नयम नयनम सती मुच्यता मुच्यता एश ब्राह्मणो नितराम गुरु सुशी से अश्वथामा बीइंग बाउंड बाय रोप्स आम she said release him release him muchatam muchatam she said release him immediately he is a brahmana a spiritual master Now imagine here is someone who has just killed her sons she is still finding reasons to respect him the point is over here the respect that is being given to ashatama was because of two reasons one he is guru putra and second he is a brahmana so she says what he has done is wrong but he being a brahmana he commands respect from us and he says and she says and she says that it was by dronacharya's mercy that all of you learned the art of military military sciences and the uh, the art of uh, controlling weapons how can we be ungrateful to dronacharya's knowledge so imagine she is finding reasons to be grateful even to someone who has killed her sons because her father his father did something good for them gratitude is directly connected to mental health there are studies that show how gratitude is directly connected to better mental health better self awareness better relationships and even a better sense of fulfillment there was once a scientific survey done where they wanted to measure the benefits of gratitude so what they did was they asked two groups of people to keep journals during the day the first group was asked to keep a uh, record things for which they felt grateful the second group was asked to record times when they felt hassled and irritated and the gratitude group reported less stress levels you know because of just simply writing down things they are grateful for simply by writing down there was a group of college students that had a lot of stress and their minds were running at full speed and they were told to spend 15 minutes before sleeping just listing down the list of things that they were grateful for and just that helped them become you know much less strained and become much more relaxed and sleep better so gratitude it helps us overcome bitterness that we carry around, uh, uh, for people around us and here look at this uh, so much bitterness uh, you know draupadi should have carried towards ashwatthama she is being grateful to uh, to the father of ashwatthama she says no i can't harm this person to feel jealous envious and bitter and grateful together can't happen you can either feel this or feel that both the both the emotions can't exist simultaneously um and therefore it is very very important that we learn to become grateful for what we have you know uh, in our temple 
when uh, we just join we are told to do some exercises some activities and especially if you look at the way radhanath swami maharaj gives his talks in many of his talks he speaks something very interesting which i want to share with you all and which is something very much connected to what draupadi is trying to do over here in this section of the bhagavatam um we all have a habit of thinking about our lives so suppose if you are asked to write down your um write down something that you don't deserve write down something that you don't deserve in your life most people write down negative experiences you know they say i didn't deserve this misfortune i didn't deserve you know this disease i didn't deserve this problem i didn't deserve this calamity so we are we have this thought process that these are things that we don't deserve but do we ever write i don't deserve the holy name i don't deserve the association of devotees i don't deserve so many good things that have happened to me in my life what makes us feel that we deserve that and we only don't deserve you know the bad things that happened i mean are we experts in the law of karma that we can say what we deserve and what we don't deserve we naturally write about what we don't deserve from the point of view of negative but here draupadi people like draupadi who have the heart of a devotee who have the heart of uh, compassion they can look at something else so um draupadi tells uh, all the pandavas and krishna present there he uh, she says dronacharya is still existing and he is existing represented by his son his wife kripi did not undergo sati along with dronacharya because she had a son so that means dronacharya exists in in his son now and therefore uh, if you if all of us are following the principles of religion and we understand the concept of dharma i don't want to make kripi the wife of dronacharya the mother of ashwatthama cry like i am crying for the loss of my sons you know there is a very interesting uh, you know concept i don't know how many of you all know of this uh, thing called landmark forum you know so one of the thing that they they tell is you should go and settle your you know like if you have any kind of scores with somebody you know a lot of pain a lot of uh, anger towards someone go and tell them i forgive you one day one guy called me and he is telling me i forgive you so i i asked him what did i do you know that you are forgiving me and he told me something that i did to him you know like 5 years back or 6 years back i don't even remember that i absolutely don't remember that and he telling me i forgive you i said see you have closed your score what about me now now you have left me open for the next hour, rest of my life i'm going to carry this in my heart that this guy is forgiving me you know for something i probably didn't do also so many times when we think that we are we are trying to be over compassionate to somebody we realize we are messing up more basically you know you settling one score but you opening up another score isn't it so here Dra- uh, draupadi is looking at it from a totally different point of view she is saying i don't want to settle my score and open kripi score over there you know i am settling my problem but i am creating a problem for kripi so she said i don't want to do that dharma has five bases for existence gyana or knowledge stabilizes the intelligence prema or love stabilizes the heart shraddha or faith stabilizes the atma the soul sacrifice or tyaga stabilizes the urges of the body and patience or dhairya stabilizes the mind so basically knowledge stabilizes intelligence love stabilizes the heart faith stabilizes the soul sacrifice stabilizes the senses and patience stabilizes the mind and when you acquire all these five things that's when you can establish dharma in your life and once these five are a part of a person and that person becomes stable 
that person is filled with compassion that person has the ability to forgive so it, it's not easy for anyone to forgive another person unless you are stable in dharma and to become stable in dharma you need to be stable in these five things and someone who is stable in these five things is stable in dharma such a person can have compassion to forgive others for even mistakes they have made so if you look at ashwatthama the way he took a decision he took a decision based on a spur you know one moment just you know, he didn't think about consequences he didn't think about the future he didn't think about the world he just thought i want to save my life that's all but draupadi and arjun when they take decisions they take based on long term consequences they take decisions based on what is going to affect the greater uh, society this is the difference between a heart that is unstable and a heart that is very stable draupadi she was in great pain but in spite of being great pain her heart was stable most of us with little pain only our heart becomes so unstable isn't it therefore that's why we say na dharma is unstable and dharma being being unstable means what these five things are unstable in our lives so draupadi the her ability to forgive and not carry anger in the heart is one of her most powerful qualities the interesting thing is if you actually study the ramayana and the mahabharat the ramayana and the mahabharat primarily most people say they are books of revenge right the pandavas took revenge on the kauravas ram took revenge on ravan but the interesting thing is both these book books end with forgiveness in the ramayana when uh, ravan is killed hanuman ji goes to sita and she he tells her how do i deal with these 700 rakshasis that were troubling you for so long should i bite them should i punch them should i tear them should i burn them what should i do with them sita says forgive them hanuman is shocked he says they troubled you so much how can you forgive them sita says they troubled me because their master was bad if they had a good master they would not be so bad she just forgave them completely and draupadi here the end of the mahabharat see there is something known as apad dharma emergency religion war is an emergency revenge is an emergency but that cannot be the way of life the way of life has to be forgiveness the way of life has to be compassion that's the way of life so the so once that calamity was taken ravan was dead sita again went back to her normal compassionate mode when the kauravas were dead which were who were really bad to society draupadi went back to her compassionate mode so all of us for a particular emergency we can be angry and we can be whatever you want but after that emergency is over you have to go back to your compassionate mode and that compassionate mode is what spirituality is about and that's what the whole concept of religion is about there's a very beautiful verse that talks about eight flowers which are very dear to lord vishnu eight flowers eight flowers that are very dear to lord vishnu so it says I, i'll drop this verse on the telegram group later you yeah, know for your reference so these eight flowers are ahimsa prathamam pushpam pushpam indriya nigraha sarvabhuta daya pushpam क्षमा पुष्पम विशेषत ज्ञान पुष्पम तप पुष्पम शांति पुष्पम तथा च सत्यम अष्ट पुष्पम विष्णु प्रीति करम भवेत सो दीज आर एट फ्लावर्स व्हाट आर द एट फ्लावर्स अहिंसा नॉन वायलेंस इंद्रिय निग्रह सेंस कंट्रोल सर्वभूत दया लव टू ऑल लिविंग बीइंग्स क्षमा फॉरगिवनेस ज्ञानम नॉलेज तप ऑस्टेरिटी uh shanti which is peace and uh, satyam which is truth these are eight flowers when you offer it to lord vishnu he is pleased with you so here draupadi is offering one flower to lord vishnu which is shama she is offering the flower of forgiveness and um this particular story that we just saw is a very interesting story because after this part you know when when uh, draupadi says what she just said um she you know completely forgave uh, shathama 
Yudhishthir Maharaj, he says, I also agree to what Draupadi says. Nakul Sahadev, they say, I also, we also agree to what uh, she says. Arjun, he said, I also agree to what she says. One Bhima is there, I don't agree at all. And Bhima says, I'll kill this fellow, no matter who says what, you know. See, Bhima does not tolerate injustice. And Bhima, he believes in expressing his opinion, even if nobody agrees to it. And Bhima believes in effort. So now the situation has become very tense. Draupadi and all the Pandavas on one side, Bhima on one side, and Krishna is in between. And Bhima is going to kill that fellow. Draupadi is saying, no, no, you can't kill him. At that point, something amazing happens in the Bhagavatam. This doesn't happen in the Mahabharata, it happens in the Bhagavatam. We'll see what happens. Nishamya Bhima Gaditam Draupadyascha Chaturbuja Alokya Vadanam Sakyur Idam Aha Hasaniva Suddenly Krishna manifests a Chaturbuj form. Four hands. Holding Bhima and, uh, with two hands, he is holding Draupadi with two hands. Keeping them aside from each other. <laughs> so this word Chaturbuja is a very interesting word because Krishna manifests Chaturbuja very rarely. You, know? you don't find Krishna manifesting Chaturbuja often. There was one saint in Vrindavan. And uh, this saint, he, he, people used to think he is a little mad. You know? Because he used to tell everyone, Krishna in Vrindavan has 400 form. Nobody believed him only. They said, how can Krishna have 400 form? He said, no, no, I've seen Krishna with 400 form. And then he tells an experience, what he had personally. He saw meditation. And in this meditation, he saw Krishna in a very interesting Leela. He saw one time, Krishna was, I'll, I'll tell. So he, uh, Krishna, he saw the saint, he saw Krishna stealing butter in somebody's house. And Krishna was a little tiny boy. He raised his hand, he was stealing butter and he was holding the, two, the pot of butter with his hands. And exactly as Krishna was holding the pot of butter with his hand, his dhoti was falling off. And Krishna, I mean obviously, like, imagine, you know, Krishna's both hands are occupied and his dhoti is falling off. It's so embarrassing, right? Suddenly Krishna manifested Chaturbhuj form. Two more hands to hold the dhoti, you know. And the saint saw it. He said, I have seen Krishna and Chaturbhuj, you know. And from that time onwards, this saint, he used to be called as Chaturbhuj Swami, you know, Chaturbhuj Baba. Everybody in Vrindavan said Chaturbhuj Baba. Because only he saw Krishna with four hands. Nobody else saw, you know. Very specially, very rarely, for some very, very interesting reasons, Krishna shows Chaturbhuj. And here is one, you know, two beloved devotees of Krishna fighting with each other. Krishna said, I can't control with two hands, you know. Bhima himself needs two hands, basically. And then therefore Krishna manifested the Chaturbhuj form to, uh, to manage uh, his two devotees. And then Krishna, out of his great compassion towards the Pandavas and at the same time understanding that they don't want to harm him, they don't want to do anything to him, uh, Krishna, uh, Krishna tells uh, uh, Arjun, he says that he is a friend of a Brahmana, but he is not a Brahmana. But, and he is an aggressor, he must be killed. And he says, these are all rulings of the scriptures. So he says, now he tells Arjun, you do what you want to do. And at that, at that point in time, Arjun uses in his intelligence. And he realizes that the only way I can do both, fulfill what Bhima wants, what Draupadi wants, and Krishna has allowed him to decide. He said, let me shave off the hair, the hair of Ashwatthama. So he cuts off the hair of Ashwatthama and they remove the jewel of Ashwatthama. So basically, by doing this, he is punished and at the same time not punished. He is killed, but at the same time not killed. For a Brahmana, being insulted like this is as good as death. So you don't have to kill a Brahmana. You only have to give him some bad words. That's all. He will die himself. And Krishna cursed Ashwatthama from his heart. And the curse was such an intense curse. He said, for 3000 years, you will wander the earth without a companion. And without anyone to talk to, you will have to, you will have the weight of all the diseases on your head. 
you will have ugly sores all over your body that will never heal and he says due to ugliness of your character and body no human will want to talk to you and even glance at you even when you yearn to die you will not die death will not even come next to you so it's like the the worst curse that anyone can ever receive in this world krishna gave him that curse the point is krishna he loves his devotees and he is present in the heart of his devotees so we just saw how uh, ashot arjuna thinks how draupadi thinks how bhima thinks and then we saw earlier how ashwatthama thinks and now krishna's heart is being revealed krishna is someone who protects us from our heart krishna is no, one of the names of krishna is known as satvasta the word satvasta means satva means the heart and satvastha means the one who stays in our heart so krishna stays in the heart of his devotees uh, there was once a, a very exalted devotee named bhakti sar he was traveling from kanchipuram to kumbakonam from one holy place to another on the way he he saw a temple a you know very holy temple of lord vishnu he decided you know before i go further let me just go have you know prediction of the temple then i'll go further so it is said if you are passing anyway next to a temple it's ideally good to do a prediction of the temple and go if you come to south bombay if you come in this area for some work you can just go around the temple you know you don't have to enter the temple also you can go in the car only around the temple you know so this devotee bhakti sar he went the prediction around the temple out outer wall of the temple but inside the temple altar something strange happened there was a pujari was doing worship of the of the lord he saw the lord is moving like this imagine deity rotating you know you know imagine radha gopina turning around like this you know so this god this devotee got really he, he didn't know what's happening the de- deity was rotating like this all in you know in like 360 degree literally and then he realized something is going on here and then he went outside he saw bhakti sar moving around in three you know uh, pradekshana so as the bhakti sar is moving the lord also is trying to you know see his devotee in that mood the lord, lord is rotating so the pujari went and told all the senior devotees in that area there some big devotee come over here you know lord is rotating around you know so everybody came running to see who is this bhakti sar and some of the very uh, um, senior senior aristocratic type of people they they felt that you know we are giving too much attention to this devotee i don't think we should need to respect him so much he's he's not from a brahmanical family or anything great as such you know at that point in time bhakti sar he prayed to the lord he said my dear lord let these devotees see you in my heart and right in front of everyone in the heart of bhakti sar everybody could see krishna with his with uh, with lakshmi devi right in the heart he didn't even have to open his heart like hanuman ji from the heart of bhakti sar they could see the supreme lord that is krishna so krishna stays as antaryami in uh, in people's hearts who are not devotees so we, we know he's called antaryami right antaryami means what antaryami is the one who is hidden in the heart but for the devotees he is not hidden in the heart the bhagavatam describes that he is in the shape of a thumb for a devotee so the heart only is this much the fist size is the say size of the heart in the size of a fist krishna is of the size of the thumb that's how prominently krishna is present in the heart of his devotees and how does krishna really reveal himself in the heart so in this particular story if you see ashwatthama's heart was filled with so much of anger and malice and fear because he was filled with so much of selfishness and uh, you know self centeredness the hearts of arjuna and draupadi and bhima if you see the hearts are filled with so much of compassion so much of selflessness and so much of um faith in the supreme lord and because these devotees have krishna so prominently present in their heart you know what is the best way krishna uh, krishna reveals himself to us and how he takes care of a devotee's heart he gives them the ability to see what he wants that's the biggest gift that a devotee can have in his in his life so here krishna is telling arjun kill him and he is waiting to see what he is going to do 
Krishna doesn't want him to kill him, obviously, because Krishna says, for, you know, in, if you with the third kind of Bhagavatam, we're going to see. He says, Brahmanas are my life. I'll cut off my hands if it, if the hand is going to harm a Brahmana. He says that. And here, I, Krishna only should leave him, kill him. So he's just waiting to see what her devotee does. And therefore, because Krishna is there in the heart of these devotees, these devotees take decisions also which are so pleasing to Krishna. I think that is the greatest gift of the Lord. If he can, if, if Krishna is really sitting in our hearts, he will help us take decisions that are really pleasing to him. Even in the most difficult times of our life, even in the biggest calamities of our life, even in the most tough choices of our life, still we will be able to take decisions that please the Lord. And that is the heart of Krishna. And therefore, he is known as Satvasta. He is sitting in the heart of the devotees. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Grantra Chimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Jai. As I said, the next time is going to be an explosion. We are going to be discussing the prayers of Kunti Maharani. Please come prepared to get your heart full of love. Because Kunti Maharani's prayers are considered to be the highlights of the Shivan Bhagavatam. So please come prepared because there is a there is going to be a lot of beautiful nectar flowing through the prayers of Kunti Maharani. Thursday. So, next Thursday we'll have the class.